Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, <clears throat> all right. So we're going to go ahead and uh, get this thing going. Uh, so welcome to today's CNCF webinar, uh, where, where we're going to be introducing a lightweight Kubernetes distribution built for the edge. I'm Matt Baldwin, Director of Cloud Native Engineering and CNCF Ambassador, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'd like to thank everyone who is joining us today. We'd like to welcome our presenters, Darren Shepard, Chief Architect, Rancher Labs, and Shannon Williams, VP Marketing, Rancher Labs. Uh, if you guys wanted to wave at everybody, that'd be awesome. Uh, so uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to talk <clears throat> as, an as an attendee. So we ask you to, if you have a question, please drop that question into the QA box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Also, please feel free to drop your, your questions there at, throughout the, the presentation so that we can just stack those up. And then at the end, we'll, we'll, I'll go through those and ask those to the, to the attendees, uh, sorry, to the, to the presenters. Uh, this session is being recorded and we'll be sending that out afterwards along with a link to the presentation. Uh, with that, I will go ahead and just hand this over to Darren and Shannon to kick off today's presentation. Uh, so here you go, guys. Have fun. Thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks uh, to everyone who's here today. Looks like we have a great, great group, a great crowd. Um, so I thought just to, to warm us up a little bit, uh, Darren and, and I actually have been hosting online meetups and, and trainings like this for the last four years or so. Um, as part of you know starting rancher and, and doing this so um you know we we both have uh you know we're both really excited about today's presentation because it's a it's it's introducing a new project the timing for this really worked out nicely we were we've been working on this and we realized that we were supposed to be presenting um on this meetup at the same day that uh, that we were announcing a new a new distro of kubernetes so we thought what better thing to do than to talk a little bit about that and, and share it with everyone here today so i'm shannon williams i'm one of the founders of rancher and i run all of our uh customer facing activities sales and marketing and, and the likes darren is my co-founder he is the chief architect and um, a really lead engineer on everything we build over at rancher and for those of you who don't know who rancher is we're a we're an open source software company we basically build open source projects um, and and commercialize those. Our, our most famous one is called Rancher, which is a management platform for containers and Kubernetes. Um, but we've, we've built all sorts of different things like Rancher OS and Longhorn and other types of projects. And we just open source everything we build and uh, pay our bills by providing support services for companies that put that stuff in production. So we've been members of the CNCF since it started. Uh, I'm on the board of the CNCF, the governing board. And you know we, we really, it, so much of what we do is based around, uh, you know, belief that this space is growing very rapidly, and, and the need for you know continuous innovation around it is is not slowing down in any way. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is is really kind of proof of that. It's how containers and Kubernetes are changing what we think of when we think of edge computing. And um, I'll talk a little bit to start us off by just kind of walking through some of the some of the things we're seeing in the market, um, you know, 20,000 teams use ranchers. We get a lot of data from people who are trying to run Kubernetes in lots of different places. And one of the things we've seen this year is enormous uh, increase in demand for Kubernetes in, in non data center applications. Edge is such a broad use case, but you know, when we talk about edge, I'm talking about stores, I'm talking about, you know, mining operations, factories, uh, cars, you know, like really so many different types of places where we're seeing containers and their, you know, their ability to be easily deployed and upgraded and their ability to package up a lot of what was historically done through scripting and through config management being, you know, very appealing for, you know, centralized application management. Well, then in, spend most of today talking about K3S, a new micro distribution of Kubernetes that we've developed. We'll talk a little bit about how we, um, how we were able to build it, what we did to kind of cut the size down and, and make it ideal for running on really small uh, footprint environments. We'll talk about some changes we made to the back end, um, you know, by introducing a SQLite as an optional data store instead of uh, instead of using etcd exclusively. Um, then we'll demo, Darren will demo quite a bit, and we'll talk a little bit about you know some of the other stuff we're working on around managing these clusters. Now that you once you get to the point where you're running, you know, micro clusters, single node clusters, how do you manage? You know, tens of thousands of these. So that's kind of our, our hope for today. Please fire away with your questions. Darren and I will be answering them as they come in. Um, and hopefully if, if you have questions afterwards, you know, we're easy to find both on Twitter as well as on the Kubernetes Slack or the Rancher Slack under the same, uh, the same handle. So pretty easy to find out there if you have questions afterwards. 
So, you know, what I thought would be helpful instead of kind of going through and, and you know, kind of t talking about, you know, one or two examples of this was to kind of you let, let some of the people who've been doing this talk to themselves. And so, you know, I pull a few articles and, and places that you can go and, and listen to companies share their experience taking Kubernetes and pushing it to the edge. One of the, one of the interesting ones that we spent a lot of time working with and talking to was the team at Chick-fil-A. They, um, they've been really public about their desire to you know, basically build and deploy a micro Kubernetes implementation into every store, um, every Chick-fil-A location. And it's a, it's a really interesting project. It gets to the heart of why we're seeing this because you know, they have and, and more and more complex software stack that they want to run in, in the store, you know, from analytics to um, the actual point of sale systems to different types of marketing applications to employee management applications right there. They want to implement more and more software that's more and more complex and includes things like analytics and monitoring, et cetera, down into the store. And, you know, historically this was all just servers, right? They would have a server closet or they would have some type of a, of a local server that they would run in the store. And now with containers and Kubernetes, you know, their, their excitement, what you hear them talk about is, you know, the ability to really know that their applications that they're deploying are exactly, you know, the same code that they tested in the lab that they tested in, you know, in other deployments. And so this is a, is a good example of someone who's been really public about the idea of running, you know, bare metal clusters of Kubernetes in the store, but they're not, they're not alone. I mean, the use cases are everywhere. Um, Target, uh, you know, get, did a really nice presentation blog last year, also in the summer, talking about their movement to putting Kubernetes in the edge and how they're using CI to push, you know, more enormous amount of software down into every store. Now that they, they have this, in more than 1,800 retail locations, they've got a Kubernetes cluster, any target you're going into. And it was a great, it's a great read. I'd recommend kind of taking a look at this. They've, they've shared more about some of the, the way they're doing CI, how they're using Spinnaker, a lot of neat stuff that they use to kind of push, push containers out quickly. And they're, you know, the whole point for them is they can now release software to the stores uh, multiple times a week, uh, sometimes multiple times a day, uh, you know, to, to improve, you know, different types of analytics and software and applications that they run locally. But it's not just in retail, and retail is one place where you see a ton of this. Um, a, a good example of, you know, more of an industrial automation type of uh, use case is one that was presented at KubeCon in Shanghai. Um, it's Goldwind. They're the, the second largest a builder and operator of wind turbines in the world. And they run now a, a massive stack of software on Kubernetes on the edge everywhere they run, um, they run these wind farms. And, and I think it gives you an idea, they shared their stack. And I think if you look at their stack, you know, we've been working with this team for a long time as they've, they've built it all on Rancher. And we've, you know, one of the things we, that was always really clear was that it wasn't the, the fact that they needed to get software out onto devices that caused them to look at containers. It was the fact that, you know, their applications running on the edge were starting to look more and more like the applications that they wanted to run in the data center. You can see, I mean, they're running Hadoop, they're running Kafka, they're running Logstash, they're running Mongo, you know, they're running all sorts of different analytics and business applications that are helping them, you know, optimize the, the actual wind turbines and optimize for the energy pr production that they're trying to get. And you know, they're now running, I wanna say 2000 or more clusters um, around the world, everywhere they're running these wind turbines and Kubernetes is powering all of these. And so we're seeing this just continuous use cases for more complex applications distributed more frequently out to more places. And you know, just like in the data center, containers and Kubernetes are just an awesome choice for deploying this type of complex software onto especially an unknown set of infrastructure or a wide variety of infrastructure and you know it all comes down to the fact containers are, are pretty awesome right it still gives us this great packaging for you know approach for taking our software testing it you know making it repeatable you know pushing it out to really you know the same reason it's valuable to, to be able to deploy to you know on-premise and in the cloud it's valuable to deploy to lots of different edge locations. Um, we found that, you know, there was, when we talked to people about why Kubernetes for these edge, it's all about the operational benefits it gives them, right? The ability to restart services, to, you know, set health checks, to, you know, define what an HA looks like for a cluster, to 
both run as a single node in many cases. It's just a single edge device. So they're running Kubernetes potentially on one ARM server, but also you know, the ability to, to cluster that. If they need to run three servers or five servers or seven servers, they can kind of expand or contract the amount of infrastructure and have the same platform experience. That's really kind of one of the big benefits of Kubernetes at the edge. And then you know, the more obvious ones, the fact that Kubernetes has a really rich infrastructure, a set of infrastructure plugins. So they can, you know, depending on what they need, as you saw in the Goldwyn one, they were using, um, they're using ClusterFS for storage. Uh, you know, in other cases, you know, people are using the local disk, they're using different types of storage services because often what they're doing on the edge does generate persistent data that needs to be managed. But it's not just storage, it's also, um, you know, the, the fact that Kubernetes has good support from ARM. And so you can use it with different chipsets and different CPUs. The other nice thing about Kubernetes is the richness of the ecosystem developing around it, right? From the monitoring to the logging to, you know, management platforms, you can, you know, Kubernetes is a standard. You can get a certified implementation of Kubernetes in lots of cases. And so it, um, you know, I can test on Kubernetes in the cloud. I can run on Kubernetes in, on ARM servers running in places like Amazon. There's really cool companies out there building, building, you know, new ARM devices. We've been working with this company called Hivecell that has just a really great ability to, to kind of stack uh, these, these small ARM servers. And so there's just a, a strong ecosystem developing around the edge and a strong ecosystem developing around Kubernetes and containers that makes this a really appealing model for teams that are trying to figure out how to push code into ATM machines or into factories or into even satellites. Um, so we see lot, lots of these different types of use cases. The the journey we've been on, you know, we've, we've sort of, I mean, I think the first time we, we ran into this use case, um, you know, people were trying to use Rancher itself to deploy, um, deploy containers and Kubernetes out to the edge. And if you think about, you know, from us, you know, before, before we ever got into, you know, kind of the idea of an edge optimized Kubernetes, we've been provisioning Kubernetes clusters with Rancher for a long time. And so, you know, Rancher has always, we've done a lot of this type of thing where, you know, users use Rancher to run lots of clusters in lots of places. Um, but, you know, one of the things we realized over time was while Rancher was, is a really good management platform for, for a lot of these clusters, often, you know, what people needed to set up and deploy a cluster, you know, they needed a lot less than what Rancher could do. And so we've kind of been on, I feel like we've been on a journey towards this for the last few years. So we, we released at least Rancher 2.0, um, you know, kind of in the beginning of 2017, I'm sorry, the beginning of 2018, not uh, beginning of last year. Um, and, you know, in there, we started the process of kind of breaking out uh, support for lots of different types of Kubernetes so that, you know, while we Rancher had its own distro that it would set up and deploy, you know, we were also supporting a lot of hosted Kubernetes. We were, you know, creating, allowing people to import existing certified clusters from different types of distros that they were setting up. And as part of that, we, we made the decision to break out something we call RKE, which was our, our um, the Kubernetes installer functionality that had been sort of bundled into, into Rancher. We kind of broke it out as its own standalone uh, open source project that people could use. And what made it, um, you, what's made it a really popular project is that it, it has this sort of ability to you know, very easily define a cluster config, um, set up what you want to deploy and how you want to deploy it, and then um, and then just deploy these things. And one of the things that, that Darren and the team did that, that kind of, I think, made RKE very popular, it's one of the reasons we, we started working with the guys at Chick-fil-A is they were using RKE, and was we learned why, one of the things that was was obvious was they were using it because it allowed them to launch a whole bunch of services and, and attach a bunch of add-ons as part of the deployment. And so, you know, they could not just sort of launch Kubernetes, but also have Kubernetes come up, you know, instantiate itself and then, you know, deploy a whole bunch of applications directly onto that. Um, but even doing all that, we, you know, we kind of found there were challenges and, and the, the, the challenges were, were pretty consistent. You know, we were, as we talked to people, they were, you know, most of the time, and, you know, most Kubernetes distributions, including RKE, really didn't have first class support for ARM, or if it did, it was sort of coming out months later. And, and this was more and more important for us as we, as we worked with people on, on, the, uh, on the edge, was clearly ARM was gonna be a big part of that infrastructure. Um, also, it was just fat, you know, when, as with, you know, for any kind of deployment of Kubernetes, we were often seeing, you know, that it was eating up half of the device. Um, this was, you know, especially for a single node type of implementation, if you're consuming four of the eight gigs of RAM, um, you're, you're really spending a lot of the 
capacity that you have out there on the edge on the management layer. And, you know, at its core, Kubernetes wasn't really ever built for this kind of offline embedded distributed management, right? It's an enterprise, it's a platform that's awesome in the data center, built for the data center. But, you know, if you want to run any kind of Kubernetes implementation, you're building, you're, you're doing a lot of, there's a lot of operational management that expects, you know, network connectivity to be consistent. There's a lot that expects you to run, you know, and have a lot of knowledge for etcd. And so we saw all these kind of challenges and started thinking about what we could do. And at the same time, Darren was working on a bunch of other things that were causing us to sort of think about how to simplify the implementation and build out of Kubernetes clusters. And... And, um, and we realized that this was something that, that would really be beneficial to you know, productize and turn into a new project. And so we've been working for the last, uh, the last you know, six months or so on a new project called K3S, which is a certified distro of Kubernetes. And I'll let Darren take it from here and really introduce you to K3S. Darren, you wanna share your screen? Nope, you're muted, Darren. Okay. Uh, yep, let me share my screen. Oh, wait, can I? Oh, yeah, I think you have to stop sharing. Oh, there you go. Okay. Give me just a second. Uh, share screen. All right. Shannon, can you see the introducing K3S? You are good to go. All right. Um, so, yeah, so Shannon's uh, introduced me before. I'm Darren Shepard. I'm the chief architect. I'm the uh, on the technical side. So Shannon has kind of talked about a lot of the business, kind of the use case and then, you know, business reasons of, you know, why we're doing this and how we've gotten here. And uh, I really just want to talk about the technology. So, um, so I'm pretty excited to launch K3S because this has been kind of a, something I've been working on. Um, K3S itself as like a standalone idea, we really, um, kind of, uh, I think just the last couple of months I've been working on it, but it's actually a, been in the works for a while because we've, we've used Kubernetes in a lot of um, very interesting ways that we've like embedded Kubernetes in different situations and really done a lot of like pretty, uh, a, a lot of big customizations to Kubernetes and whatnot. So um, this is kind of the result of a lot of work that we've been doing for a while. And I'll kind of touch on some of those, like where some of this stuff came from, from different projects we were working on. Um, but so introducing uh, K3S, uh, right up front, I wanted to kind of point out, um, so it's a lightweight certified Kubernetes distro. So it's like, you know, technically what is this thing? So it's, it's really just a smaller distribution of Kubernetes. Um, but the key thing that's kind of different is because there's been a lot of uh, projects that, you know, have, have done like easier to install Kubernetes or smaller uh, footprint or whatever, but they're pretty much all oriented towards development. So it's like Minikube or Microcates or, or uh, Local Cube. I think that one's been gone. Basically, any synonym you can think of for small, the project probably exists, like Tiny, tiny Pico, Nano, whatever. There, there's, there's been a lot of them. But the key thing that's different about K3S is we wanted this to, one, be certified. So we've already gone through all the certification. We passed all the tests. This does pass the conformance. Um, and, and we really we want this for production. So this is not going to be just, you know, for development or, or test, this is really first, you know, real production workloads. This is, you know, hopefully, you know, as we get more and more users, this will become a well, well supported product. Um, so, you know, how big is it? Well, it's the binary is, it's a, just a single binary that you download. It's uh, 40 megabytes and it can run on a machine that's got 512 megabytes of RAM. And um, uh, that's kind of the lowest, lowest end I'll show, I'll demo later uh, running on a Raspberry Pi with gigabyte of memory and you'll actually see the real memory usage and, you know, I have some workload running there. Um, but it's, you know, it's significantly smaller. I mean, just kind of uh, uh, anecdotally, it's about a fourth the size of a, of a regular upstream Kubernetes uh, setup. So if you if you run like kubeadm and just set up a, a single node cluster with kubeadm it that typically takes up around uh, a little over a gigabyte of memory um, whereas k3s a single node would be like more like 250. so the binary is 40 megabytes um, that is a compressed binary it's gzip so that that is lying a little bit it it, it has it um it will it kind of dynamically decompresses as you as you run it um so uh 
but that 40 megabyte binary includes not just Kubernetes, but also everything else you need to run. Like, so you can have, you know, uh, let's say like an Alpine system, that's something that doesn't have like really anything on in the OS and you can just run the K3S binary. You don't need Docker, you don't need any host utilities, um, anything. It's pretty much, we just need the kernel and, uh, and uh, you know, proper mounts for like Proxys and Dev. So you just run this one binary. It includes c container D, flannel, core DNS, CNI setup, um, a lot of the additional stuff um, that is kind of outside the scope of core Kubernetes. Um, so yeah, so we've we've packaged this differently. Like one of the reasons why a regular Kubernetes installation takes up so much memory is just like the duplication of the processes of like API server, controller manager, scheduler, you know, there's reasons why those are packaged the way they are. And if you're running a full scale cloud, massive cluster, um, you know, it makes sense that they're separated the way they are. But when you get down to smaller clusters, it, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't actually make sense anymore. So we've combined these multiple components into like single processes. We're still keeping proper failure boundaries. You know, we didn't re reduce the reliability or you know, kind of fin uh, key failure scenarios like, you know, decoupling the control and data plane. Those are all stay intact, but we've, we've combined certain processes to reduce them, the memory footprint. Um, we added SQLite in addition to etcd. So this one is, this has been, um, some there's a project that I've worked on for a long time with Kubernetes of experimenting with different backends to Kubernetes. Um, etcd is fine. I mean, I've uh, you know nothing against etcd, but there's there's no technical reason why etcd should be the only backend implementation like storage. Like, why can't I store it on a different key value store? Why can't I store it in a database? You know, technically, I should be able to use whatever data store. Um, so that's actually ends up being kind of hard because the behavior of etcd is pretty hardwired into Kubernetes. So to, to bring in a different data store, like I know there's community effort to bring in like console, but I don't think that ever went through. Um, but with a relational database uh, like SQLite, MySQL, Postgres, those, those are flexible enough that we can actually bring them in. So that's something I've just, I've experimented with a lot in the past of supporting different data, data sources. Um, but for this project, it, it made a lot of sense that, you know, since we already had kind of that technology and figured out how to do this, it's like, well, it made a lot of sense to bring in SQLite because it's significantly smaller memory footprint for, uh, for a single, you know, a single master cluster. So obviously SQLite is a database that runs in memory. So you're not going to get an HA, you know, multi-master setup with SQLite. Um, but there's a lot of use cases, especially when we start going to the, to the, to the edge where, you know, that doesn't matter as much, or there's, there's different ways to deal with this of just, you know, SQLite is just a file. You can back up the file, you can restore it. Um, so there's a lot of reasons, a lot of use cases where you just don't care that much. Um, but we did this, it's, it's just an option. So you can still use etcd. Uh, but the SQLite does, does make it a lot smaller and, and it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite nice to deal with it because it's, Everything's just kind of stored in the one SQLite database. You can use SQLite tools to look at the data store. Uh, it's quite easy to, to interact with. Um, so uh, we also, we've released this, like we wanted to make sure it was important from day one that we had full support for Intel ARM64 and ARM v7. So you'll find that there's pretty decent support uh, for ARM64 out in the ecosystem, but ARM v7, not so much. Uh, and, and kind of the reason for that is when you look at like running Kubernetes on a Raspberry Pi, just the regular like upstream one, um, it's really, it's kind of too fat. It's not really that practical. So a lot of people don't really target ARM v7. Um, and so that was one, something actually we struggled a lot with as we were releasing K3S was finding like projects that support ARM v7, making sure the multi-arc images were there. Um, you know, working on things like that, um, fixing various bugs and like container D around uh, ARM v7. Uh, so there's quite a bit of effort. I mean, I would say I would say over half the effort of like trying to release K3S was actually getting this stuff seamlessly working on ARM. Um, 
so from day one, so we support all, all three architectures and everything I'll be demoing today will be on ARM, but there is Intel available and you know, there's, uh, you know, just pick whatever architecture makes sense for you. Um, so yeah, just a final point is that this is an open source project. It's uh, not yet a product with Rancher. Um, I'm sure, you know, if, you know, there's a m enough demand and we're already seeing a good amount of demand, we'll turn this into a pro uh, a, a product. But right now this is, we're just an announcing the open source project. Also just kind of give you where this is. Like this is not what we would consider GA. There's still things that we're working on like around the HA setup and, and whatnot before we would say this is G GA. Um, but it, it does, it, you know, it does work. It passes the certifications. Um, you know, we have good, good amount of users been trying it out running different ways, but this is, this is early. So this is like beta, beta level. Um, you know, we'll focus on GA, you know, so, sometime this, hopefully this year. Um, okay. So, um, you know, so as I said, you know, what, what, what do we actually do to make this happen? Like what are the kind of technical details? So kind of on the left, you have all the things we removed and on the right is what we added. So fundamentally to make things smaller, like less memory, we had to remove something. Um, and initially the way this project first started was we were working on another, th another project called Rio, which is this experimental project that I started last year that focuses on the serverless space and service mesh and application. And uh, when we were doing that, we're like, well, we want this to be so easy to install. Let's like, let's actually embed Kubernetes in it. So you don't even have to install Kubernetes. So what we did was we just took Kubernetes, we ripped out every single feature we didn't want, embedded it inside of Rio. Um, but then we ended up realizing we're like, hey, this is actually really neat because Rio ended up being such a simple way to get the Kubernetes stuff running that you know, we saw a lot of value in pulling it out as a separate project. Um, beyond the fact that like we were seeing demand for edge and all those other things is uh, you know, we were kind of happy with the kind of technically what we did, but at the time that we did it, we ripped out tons of features. I mean, things that like people care about what we didn't care about at the time. So we kind of changed the scope and we said, well, well, let's figure out if we can do this same like reduction in size, but, but not break the core functionality of the cluster. So, really what it is is we were moved uh, legacy functionality like some of the really old API versions um, because the you know the way Kubernetes does things like the APIs will go through you know alpha beta and then stable so some of the older like alpha APIs we've removed um, uh, these are things that like we've just from what we've seen they're not they're not used if we see that uh, there is actually you know some great reason of why these old alpha APIs need to be brought back then then we'll probably uh, we'll we'll pull them back in, but but the idea is these these are features that we don't we're not seeing very often. And you know, as uh, as um as Shannon mentioned in the beginning, we have Ranch has got something twenty thousand clusters that that people are are running on. So we've we've a good amount of uh, users that we've been seeing. So we uh we pulled out any legacy feature. We also pulled out any non default feature, and these are features that are basically not even available in cloud managed. Uh, Kubernetes instances, so like GKE and EKS, and and those ones that manage the 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 control plane for you, they don't give you the ability to change like admission controllers and things like that. And so these are features that you know typically you don't even want to use because they're not very portable. Um, but there's also ways to do these now that don't require changing the the configuration of the app server so like emission controllers we pulled out a lot of the emission controllers that aren't enabled by default but there's still the webhook value like the, the webhook based ones and so there's still all the proper extension ones um, so you can still you know bring in emission controllers you just have to do it through the webhook approach which is the preferred approach anyways um, anything that was an alpha feature we just removed um, they're not enabled by default. Um, you know, a lot of them aren't even stable. That's the idea of alpha. So we just removed them. So we kind of, the, the intention there is, you know, if you care about alpha features, uh, you know, use an upstream distribution for right now. Uh, eventually, if those alpha features are good, they'll become beta and then they will be in K3S. Uh, we removed in cloud provider, the in-tree cloud providers. So we didn't get rid of cloud provider like in general, just the in-tree ones. So like the, 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 the approach, of the community is, has been, you know, let's pull everything out of the built-in binary and, and allow them to be deployed as, you know, separate add-ons. And so we've done that with, uh, 
so anything that's basically in tree that you know the the community would like to remove uh you know basically we just went ahead and removed it um so a couple things there is that you can still bring in a a, a cloud provider but the kind of where k3s shines is not going to be super deep integration with clouds like you might as well just use gke or eks or digital oceans kubernetes you know whatever the cloud provided one those are going to give you the best experience um, k3s is, is more you know edge or you know all these is other use cases so those things just didn't even really make sense so also we remove the storage drivers so again it's the same thing of like the entry storage drivers they can all be replaced now basically by csi so you can just deploy different storage drivers through CSI. So with K3S, we just kind of say, you know, go the CSI route. There's quite a few of them available already. And then the last thing that we removed, and this is optional, it still works, but by default, we don't use Docker. So Docker adds a good amount of memory. Also, you know, it's something you need to install and manage on the host. Uh, so we don't by default use Docker. We instead embed and use container D. But this is optional because I know there is still a lot of people who want to use Docker. So it's just a flag when you run the agent. You can just say, you know, dash dash Docker and it will use Docker instead of container D. At that point, you have to install and manage Docker yourself. So those are all the things that we removed. Uh, so uh, that's how we got the memory footprint down that and the, the fact that we combined a bunch of processes. Um, and, and so the things that we added to, to K3S to make it you know, easy to run and is, is first is we just simplified the installation. We really, like the approach of like most deploying Kubernetes is you run some type of installer, some like something which goes and deploys Kubernetes or configures it or whatever. And we just, we wanted to get rid of that. We just, we wanted this as simple as possible. Just like, just run a binary, like you know, just set up a system D unit and it, it just runs. Um, we wanted to get rid of all that, that kind of bootstrapping. And, and this is to make it easier to kind of package within these like edge scenarios, like you bake it into the image. Um, you don't need a lot of operations. Uh, you know, so you can just kind of, you know, just package it up really easy. And I'll show that a little bit more when I demo it. Uh, so we added SQLite. So I talked a little bit about that before, so I won't go more into that. Um, so we have TL TLS management. So one of the kind of the hardest parts I think of getting Kubernetes set up is, is managing all the certificates and everything. And so by default, we just generate all the certificates and manage it um, already. You know, there's already good work going on in the, in, uh, the community of, of simplifying that stuff, like the uh, Kubelet can do like cert rotation and whatnot. And so we just make it a little bit easier that just, we just automatically set these things up. Um, uh, so you don't have to do anything, any TLS stuff, uh, it, by default, you don't have to you know, worry about any certificates. Um, we do uh, automatic manifest and hard shell, shell manifest management. What that means is basically, I'll, I'll show this later, is that we just make it really easy to deploy manifests or Helm charts. Uh, and this is, uh, makes it really easy for packaging and, and different use cases like CI. And I'll show that when I demo it. Uh, and so the last thing is we just in, we include all the other dependencies that we need, like Containerd and Flannel and Core DNS, CN, uh, CNI stuff. Um, all of these things, everything's optional. Anything that we include, there's some way to disable it and bring your own. But we wanted to have a default one that works, you know, kind of for everyone. So you can like disable Flannel and install a different CNI driver if you wanted to. Um, but for the most part, you know, a lot of the use cases, Flannel, you know, works well. Okay. So this is just a picture of, of basically how uh, how it's all packaged is like we just basically have this we present Kubernetes as just like an architecture of a server and an agent. So uh, if you're doing like a, a simple single master setup, you just have one server, and so that just has one process that's running. Uh, by default, when you run the server, like when you run the binary, it's K3S server. It will automatically launch the agent on the same machine, so it becomes a single node cluster. You don't have to. Uh, you can disable it so you can separate the server, but in practice, what you see is people usually um, run Kubernetes on the management plane too, so they can manage um, uh, control plane components. And then additionally, for like the edge use case, you want to reduce the number of nodes you have anyway, so why would you dedicate uh, you know, a single, a full machine just to the server? Um, so once you have the server running, then you can just go to any, uh, any other, any other uh, you know node you want to add to the cluster and you just have to run the agent and the agent is going to spin up one process 
kits, which has embedded in it this tunnel or the the cube proxy, the kubelet, flannel, uh, and then it's going to launch container D. And then there's this component in there that the tunnel proxy. And and the reason what this is is like we is the is uh, the way Kubernetes works today or like upstream Kubernetes works is there's bi-directional communication from the control plane to the kubelet. This means that there's both outbound and inbound TCP connections going between those. So the inbound TCP connections to the nodes for a lot of scenarios causes problems. Um, it's a little harder to manage from a security and networking perspective. So what this tunnel proxy is, is it sets up a tunnel from the agents to the server and it makes makes it so that all communication from the nodes is outbound. Uh, and so this is something we've we've added in as you know, just as part of K3S. So this makes the networking, you know, kind of setting this up in a secure manner a lot easier because the nodes just need an outbound connection. And there's no other listening ports. Like by by default, this is supposed to be secure. The only port that you really have to worry about is the VXLAN port. And like we're really trying to see if we can switch to like IPsec or WireGuard to make the networking secure by default. But right now there is from one security perspective is you have to worry about that VXLAN port. It's like, it might be 4789. Um, that port is open. Uh, it needs to be like firewalled some, some way. But we're trying to figure out how to secure that one by default because we really want to you know, make this, um, uh, you know, just le less things that you have to worry about when you're deploying this. Okay, so um, yeah, we move on for there. There was one question that came in. I think sure. we to talk about um, one. It was the question was, uh, you know, what support is there for persistence? And, and I think we talked about a lot of stuff that's pulled out, but you know, in terms of storage drivers, you know. Yeah, I mean, so that so we didn't we haven't like fundamentally changed what Kubernetes is. So you can still have storage drivers. You just need to pull them in through CSI, um, and we actually have a really nice local storage driver that we've developed. Um, it's not included in K3S, but it's really easy to develop or to, to deploy that gives you a, a local storage version of PVs that works a little easier than the upstream one. But, um, but, the, but, the, but the short of it is, is persistent works um, just fine following whatever normal Kubernetes model of viewing PVs and stateful sets or PVCs. Um, you just need to have some, some driver. You, so we don't right now include a storage driver that is something I've been toying with the idea of, of you know, uh, whether or not we should include like a local storage one, uh, so you can at least use PVs uh, out of the box. Um, but if you're looking at persistence, you know, you really need to give some consideration to you know what what type of storage. But so persistence works. You know, you just have to give it that extra thought that is required in general with Kubernetes of you know what's the driver that you're going to use and um, and how you're going to manage it. Right. I think that's a good, I mean, just that, that applies to almost everything as well. There was other questions about, you know, the, the entry cloud providers. Again, all these things can be just added back in if you need them. We just remove them by default because otherwise they take up a lot of space. They're bundled in. They just kind of fatten up what gets deployed because you include all the cloud providers instead of the ones that you, if you do want to run this in cloud, you just run the Google or Amazon or DigitalOcean or whatever cloud provider you happen to need. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, honestly, a lot of the things that we did to lighten up Kubernetes is like, it's it's things that will naturally happen within the Kubernetes community anyways. It's just it's going to take like years for it to be done upstream, because they need to continue to support all this backwards. Yeah, one more question, Darren, that was about the TLS management. Jacob said, is the TLS management internal, a la Docker Swarm, easy to export, and our plug into external PKI? I want to just answer that quickly. Yeah, so I mean, we generate the certificates. Um, it's not the best for um, plugging into external PKI. I mean, you can generate your own certificates and bring those and place those on the host if you're going to want to do like automatic signing by some external CA. Um, no, that's that not the best support for that right now. Um, it's so it's all kind of internal management, but it's not it's not as um, it's not as like kind of baked in as Swarm where there's like, you know, no chance you can kind of get to it because we are still launching like the regular components with the regular command line arguments and whatnot. So we're just kind of generating files and putting them on disk. And so it's possible if you don't want to use the generated ones, you can just put in your own certificates. Um, but there's not like a kind of like, I guess you could probably get clever with Cert Manager because Cert Manager you can allow 
um, you could probably wire that up to do external CA integration. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot you can do and, and, and we're not, it's not, so I, I think kind of the, the short answer there is it's like, it's not heavily baked in. You can get to it if you want to do more advanced use cases. And we're definitely open, you know, if, if you're, there's something you want to see supported, you know, put in an issue. This is all about, I mean, there's all these projects that we launched with Rancher. This is all, all about the users. We just, you know, whatever it is you want to do, let's, you know, <laughs> figure out how to support it. So. Cool. Should I keep, keep going, Shannon? Okay. Um, I'm just going to let you guys know uh, we're at 15 minutes before the top of the hour. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see. I think I have. Uh, yeah. So I'll run through. The, so, um, yeah, we talked a lot about edge for use cases. And um, I wanted to, to kind of point out is, is uh, edge is like kind of the core business reason why we're doing this. Like we see real demand for that. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, that's kind of like the, the most obvious thing we can kind of market and put this towards, but like K3S, I think is so much, uh, there's a lot more potential of what you can do if you just have this, you know, really simple, easy to run uh, Kubernetes. And so that we really think there's a lot more uh, use cases for it. And, and so we're really, you know, we're, we're kind of excited to see what people do with it. Um, you know, there's things that we're looking at because like, you know, we realized it's like, hey, this actually ends up being a really nice uh, replacement for Minikube if we were to put a little bit of UX around it or, or, or whatnot because it's smaller, it uses less CPU, you know, it's nicer on your laptop. Um, so there's different things. So like CI environments, uh, we started heavily using that internally. Um, so anytime like we're running CI and we need to launch Kubernetes and run some tests against it, we, we swap that all out for K3S. Um, so there's a lot of different use cases. It's not just for Edge and ARM. Um, you know, there's a lot of things you could kind of figure out where you might want to put K3S. Okay, so I'm going to go through the demo. Um, this this is on the website, this information here. Uh, but uh, I'm going to go through and kind of demo, show you a little bit of this in action. And the demo is not going to be very long because, I mean, honestly, there's not, there's not a lot to this in, in terms of a uh, it's just getting the Kubernetes cluster up and running. So I just want to first show, like, this is a Raspberry Pi. Um, so if I look at, so what I have running here uh, is, uh, let's see. Okay, so what I have running here, is, this is like just a, uh, I, I deployed OpenFAS. So I've got uh, K3S running, some of the various services. I'll talk about these in a little bit uh, when I run through the installation. And then I have OpenFAS running, so I've you know got some functions running. I can hit those functions, uh, you know. Uh, let's see. So like here, here's like Figlet, you know. So this is all running on a Raspberry Pi. Um, so you know, I could, so I got this this full thing set up. So you can see from like the kind of free memory, a Raspberry Pi has a gig of memory. So I still have free half, you know, half of a gig. So I have Kubernetes plus OpenFAS, and then a couple functions deployed and I still got a half half a gig free so um, it's you know it's not like we made kubernetes super tiny I mean it's still a couple hundred megabytes but even on something like a raspberry pi you still have a good amount of space for your applications to manage it um, so it is even feasible to run it on a device this small and we we do test it on um, we have these uh, uh, my favorite arm device I have is a beagle a beagle bone pocket it's a little five five twelve megabyte uh, ARM v7 device and, and it, it will run on those two, but it ends up taking up the majority of the memory. So it's a little impractical, but, but I just want to kind of just show and the, and the way that I set this up is really, there's not much to it on a raspberry Pi. I just, you run the curl, the, this curl script. Um, and I'll, I'll show that more in detail in, in a second. Uh, and then the only thing you need to know for a raspberry Pi is, is, uh, what is it? The, the, command line is it that one yeah is you have to add these two parameters if you don't add these two parameters on a raspberry pi k3s will actually tell you it'll fail to start and it'll say hey you need to add these parameters but anyways i just want to quickly show that i'm not going to demo a lot on the raspberry pi because things just move slower um but so it is actually feasible to run it that small of a device they're still memory free um let me see if i look at the you know it's not like it's sitting here the load average oops, load average is still below one uh, it's not like it's killing the killing the machine, but we are working on trying to figure out how to get this even a less CPU. 
you know, figuring out this is just kind of Kubernetes regular churn. Um, and so we're, we're doing more work on trying to get the, the CPU even lower. Okay, so I'm gonna walk through the installation on, these are ARM 64 boxes. So these are a little bigger and faster. These are running in Amazon. We do a lot of our ARM stuff on Amazon or Packet. Both of those are great providers to get ARM servers. Um, so the simplest way to get up and running is, is the curl script and I'll, I'll show that, but then that kind of hides what's going on. So I'll do it manually too. But just to show you, you know, what's going on here. So if you run this curl script, uh, this basically sets up an uninstall script, which is kind of nice so you can get rid of it easily. But basically we just copy the binary. We symlink uh, these two programs to the binary. So you get kubectl and CRICTL. CRICTL. CRICTL is kind of like your Docker PS. It's the way you can look at containers locally on the node. Uh, then we register it with systemd and then start up systemd. And so um, in theory, this should work. Maybe it takes about, yeah, okay. So it already, it's up, it's up and running. So, um, so let me explain to you like by default what you get in the install, oops, uh, what you kind of get by default what's deployed. So in a regular cluster, what we do is we deploy, uh, so we have core DNS running. Um, and then this is, uh, so we have core DNS running for uh, you know, the DNS support. We install traffic. So initially we started with the Nginx ingress controller, um, but it's not, well, it's not supported at all on ARMv7. So traffic is supported on ARMv7, plus it's actually a lighter weight, less memory than the Nginx controller. Um, so we right now default to traffic. Again, everything in here is optional. You can flip them off and bring your own thing if you don't like this. Um, so we automatically deploy traffic. So you get an ingress controller already working. Uh, and then you'll notice that this has the external IP already set up. So what we have running is um, we have a very simple service load balancer that it works based off of host ports. So because that's always been a problem of like, if you don't have cloud integration, how do you get the service load balancer in Kubernetes to work? So we just developed a very simple one that like, will just, um, if there's a host port available, it will pick one of the nodes and use a host port. And so this works really well for these smaller set, these you know, kind of smaller clusters. But again, you can, um, you can bring in a different uh, service load balancer like Metal LB or something like that. Um, so uh, those are the two, two main things that are running is traffic and core DNS. And then uh, this, this is the load balancer that's, that's doing the host port thing. This basically takes up no memory. It's just, it's just a, it's like a pause container because it's really just done with IP tables. Uh, and then this is the Helm install. Okay, so the Helm install, so, okay, wait, I'll, I'll come back to the Helm install once I show the, the installation. So I'm gonna uninstall this. I'm gonna just delete it. So you can just run that script, it gets rid of it. Um, so it does a decent job. We're still, there's a, a couple binaries still running, but like we're, we're, we're trying to get that, that working a little better. Let me kill those ones. So I know everything's totally gone. Um, oops. Okay. But I'm going to show you kind of the, the manual setup just so you see, cause the script, I kind of feel like it makes it super simple, but you know, kind of obfuscates what's going on. And so if you're doing this manually, you just go to our releases, go to our latest release. Uh, just look for the K3S binary you want. So I'm going to do ARM64. ARM um, copy that. And so you can see here, this one's, it's 32 megabytes. It's actually less than 40. Um, so we're just going to download this, uh, move that over to K3S, make it uh, executable. Uh, and then we just run it. So we just say K3S server. So this is going to launch the server. And then additionally, uh, it's going to register itself as, as a, as a local node. So, okay. So the server has started now it's launching the agent. And so the agent will take a little bit to like get the cedar and whatnot. But when this launches, it runs this, this command or it, it outputs this, this information here. So it's, it says, if you want to join a node to the cluster, just run this command and you need to give it the node token. And the node token is here in this file. So if I cat that, it gives you this, this big long token here. So it's an approach very similar to kubeADM, but it's slightly different because it has to, it, it, it does some magic to set up the TLS certs and do things securely. Um, 
okay, so I, so I have the server running on this, this terminal here. Let me flip over this one. This is another machine. And I'm just going to run, do the same thing to join the, the node to the cluster. Let me see, copy that. Do, do, do. Well, that's not good. There it goes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. So now let me go back over here. We're going to run this command. And we need that node token. Where's it? All right, let's see. Starting agent. Oh. Oh shoot, I hope I don't have like a security group issue. Uh, oh, I bet you it is security groups. Oh shoot. Yeah, I always fail. Um, okay, well, we'll just go past that. Because <laughs> I bet you the security group, I just launched these two machines. I don't think it's it's communicating. Um, um, anyways, so, because I'm kind of running out of time here, but. So the it's it's not it's not it's not actually because I think I didn't set up the security groups between the, these two machines. But the so basically that would just join. It does the exact same thing. Like you would see kind of this output here where it connects and it and it joins together. Um, so when you have once you have this running, oops, K three S cube CTL kit node. Okay, so this one's running here. So once you have this this running, there's one thing I want to point out is is like this ends up being a really nice thing to put into to, to um, CI because there's this directory here for manifest. Basically, any manifest you put in here, it will just automatically deploy it. Um, so like for if you want to use K3S in a CI environment, you can just basically create a directory, put some YAML files in there, run the binary, it launches the cluster, automatically deploys, and then you can start running tests and whatnot. Um, and so you can see here, like that's how we deploy core, core DNS. We, we're running core DNS, but a lot of things are packaged as Helm charts. So we have automatic integration with Helm charts too, where you can just go and create a, uh, a manifest here for a Helm chart uh, you just put like what the chart is, if there's a repo um, that's, you know, this one is in the upstream repo, but you can put repo, uh, whatever parameters you want to set, and then it'll deploy the Helm chart for you. So the way we actually deploy traffic is through a Helm, Helm chart. So we have like integrated, this is just to make it easier to package and get, you know, kind of software bootstrapped and running uh, on the cluster. Um, so uh, let me see. So that's, that's most of So the, the other thing I just wanted to point out was that for the installation, the way we did this is we, we ran the agent, unfortunately kind of stinks this failed, but um, such as live demos. Um, yeah. So you, so you can see the connection timed out because there's, it's either a networking issue or I don't have security group set up. But, um, but I wanted to point out that the way this is done to bring up a cluster is you run the server, it generates this token, then you use the token to join the cluster. That makes it difficult to easily automate to bootstrap a full cluster. So there is another approach. Instead of using the generated cluster, you can um, pass a cluster secret, a shared secret, which is just any random string you want to come up with. So if you give the same string to the server and the nodes, then you don't have to ha like do that two-step process. Um, so it makes it super easy to bring up a cluster with a shared secret. Um, so you can start getting in, like you can start doing some really interesting things with this. Um, like for example, if you're, you know, into like Docker and Docker, this is like a compose file to launch uh, a K3S cluster. Here's the server and like, here's the nodes. So I can just do something as simple as like Docker compose up uh, scale node equals 10 something like this. And then, you know, in a couple seconds here, I get a 10 node Kubernetes cluster that I can test with. Let's see if it actually comes up. Um, so let's see. 
let's see if this actually came up. Darren, we're about out of time. I think it's at the top of the hour yep. now. Yeah, so that came up. Anyways, so um, that's the end of the demo. We're at the end of the time. I'll hand it back to Shannon. Sorry I took up the, your last slides there. It's okay. Um, I think you covered most of what uh, um, most more important things. Matt, I know you need to kind of wrap us up. Do you want to kind of yeah. go through and we'll, we'll kind of, I can take the rest of the questions and, and. Yeah. So what I just want to tell all the audience is that we're going to have the slides and recording of this posted later today. Uh, so, you know, look for those. Um, uh, we also look forward to seeing you at our next CNCF webinar. Um, so you, everybody have a great day. I'm going to let Shannon take over on the Q and A. I see that we have, 11 questions right now, Shannon, um, all really good questions too. So I will let you answer those. I have to go to another meeting. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Thanks for hosting. Thanks. Yeah. See you guys later. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Um, yeah. Lots of questions, Darren, and then we can wrap up after that. But um, let, let me start with Farzad's question. He said, is it possible to create multiple subclusters under one master node in the future? Um, no, no um, that's not kind of a use case we're going towards. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the short of it is no. The, the, it's, it's simple enough to, to just run a bunch of server containers. Um, so you can have like one, you know, one uh, server machine and then just launch a bunch of containers, which are like the server processes and then join nodes to those. Um, but we don't, we don't kind of plan on it, kind of doing multi-tenant tenants, I, I guess. <laughs> So there was a, another question, uh, DW asked, can you say something about how the agent compares to virtual kubelet? Could the agent replace the virtual kubelet in the future for the hybrid environment? VK seems to struggle with the two-way communication issue mentioned, for example. Also, could an agent join a conventional cluster? Thanks, Doug. Uh, the agent can't join a conventional cluster because the agent relies on the tunneling and the bootstrap process that we have built into K3S. So the kind of the wrapper around the agent uh, won't work. But having said that is we do, besides, so there's two things about, about K3S is we made it smaller and then we wrapped it in this installer. If you just want a smaller Kubernetes but you don't care about our installer, we do have the Hypercube available and, you, and from our source you can build the individual binaries. But so you could pick up this hypercube and you could run it and it would give you a smaller footprint cubelet. Um, but you know, and then you would have to do everything else. So that's a very advanced use case, but that that's basically, this gives you just a smaller uh, Kubernetes. Like the hypercube of Kubernetes is I think around 220 megabytes and ours is 70. So you can just see like, you know, ours is much smaller. Um, so, Okay, and then the last thing is the virtual kubelet. The virtual kubelet is uh, kind of a different use case. So a virtual kubelet will work with K3S, um, but the virtual kubelet is, uh, it really is, a, it, that's for kind of virtualizing the idea of a node. You know, so like a node becomes, you know, a node is basically a, like a huge cluster or resource pool. Um, so that's kind of a different use case, and so there's there's not exactly an overlap, but the virtual cube still will will work with K3S, and and in different we're we're actually doing a lot of interesting things around virtual cubelets in different kind of pro, uh, uh, research stuff that we're doing right now. Awesome. Um, Giannis asked, is Flannel in charge of the north south load balancing, or is there another load balancer I didn't see? I think. You already showed traffic. Just... Well, fl flannel is for the overlay networking. And so from the north-south, um, it's a combination of the ingress controller and the service load balancer. So the service load balancer, the one that's built in, is just based off of IP tables. Um, and, you know, and then the ingress controller is based off, uh, is, and that's traffic. So that's going to give you the north-south uh, traffic or north-south uh, um, load balancing. Awesome. And then um, Hussein asked a question. He said, I was wondering, following your philosophy of removing the unused slash unnecessary parts and given that you use SQL Lite as the default back end database, why do you still include etcd in the package? Does it still do something? Well, we don't include etcd in the package right now. We might because we're still actually working on the HA solution because um, we're, uh, we're going to make the, the HA uh, kind of very simple just like we've done the single master. It's kind of very simple. Um, so right now the full etcd is not included in the package. Like, so if you want to use etcd 
you would have to basically configure it yourself. Um, right now, just due to a little bug, it doesn't actually technically work, but it will be fully supported. Um, we'll very quickly, we'll, we'll fix that. Um, but right now, the etcd management, if you were to do it, you would be spinning up and managing etcd yourself. So that's what I was saying is like, we want to make that even easier. So we will probably include etcd into K3S. Um, we're not sure. We don't think it will add a huge amount to the binary size and the, and the memory size, um, the way we plan on running it, because uh, we've done this in other projects. But if it does end up being an issue, then we might have two different like binaries, one for standalone, like a, a single server and one for an HA setup. Awesome. Um, Tom asked if we could compare and contrast this with Azure IoT and Ballerina or Bellina's virtual kubelet models. I don't know if you know what those are. I don't know much about either of those. Yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm not super, but it's, um, so those are kind of different, uh, taking a completely different approach. Um, and I think that's what I'm saying, like the virtual kubelet is kind of a whole different approach on how to do and that's kind of been like a lot of people's thing of like well how can i do iot but what that does is like basically the virtual kubelet is like let me virtualize well i mean obviously let me virtualize the kubelet so i now have other things which i present as though it's a kubelet so this is kind of like where you get out of the upstream community stuff and you turn into like proprietary cloud because it's like they just have some other implementation that happens to present an API like the kubelet. Um, so those end up being like very specific to whatever implementation. Um, so what we're doing now is I, I think is a little bit more practical, practical approach. Um, but as, as I said before, we are doing some interesting things with virtual kubelet, but I think that's just a little bit, farther out there and the danger with the virtual kubelet right now is the fact that it is like this big proprietary wedge um and so we're trying to figure out you know kind of what to do around that okay another question sergey asked if uh if you could run k3s on android that is a great question i have no clue um so i am a big chrome os user uh and there is a C groups issue in general of um, there's one of the, I think it's the CPU set C group that makes it so you can't typically run like OCI containers on, a, on, on the device. Um, but I've been looking to work around that. Like it's just a patch and run C. So I would say it's probably feasible to do it, but it won't work right now, but I'd be very, very interested in it um, because I've been trying. So the, the reason why I mentioned Chrome OS is Chrome OS and Android are very close to each other now. The, the, the way a Chrome OS kernel is set up is very similar to the, to the Android kernels. Um, but I, I, I think it might actually be possible. I'll be inter interested if, uh, to try that one out. I'll probably try it now, but I know it won't work at the moment, but I think it is feasible. Anand asked if you could run it on a Mac and which version should you download to run it on a Mac? Well, so if you're running it on a Mac, it's, you're going to be running it. Like the, the only way to really do this is you have, I mean, it basically it only works on Linux, right? So it's the same thing as Docker. Docker, you know, pretty much just works on Linux. So um, what you would do if you wanted to run it on a, on a Mac is I would say like try in the, in the repo, we have like the Docker compose setup. Um, you can try running like the Docker compose and that basically will just bootstrap and it'll run K3S inside of, inside of Docker. So if you have Docker for Mac, then you can run this. Cause we were looking at this and, and this was not our initial focus, like the, the, the laptop or the development environment, but we actually realized it's like, well, K3S on the laptop could be really nice. So I've been toying around with the idea of, creating a kind of a separate uh, wrapper around K3S or designed just for laptops um, in the spirit of D-Lite. Um, if you guys remember, that's an old Docker project or it was for Docker. But I would say like probably the easiest way right now is, is, through, the, is through the Docker Compose, which will run K3S inside of Docker for Mac. Lots more questions coming in. So feel free to keep going. Uh, Darren and I will, will, will keep answering. Um, David asked what, was the timeline for a GA release? 
Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't really commit to that. So that all depends on user demand. I mean, to be honest, what we've seen, like, cause you know, we're just actually officially announcing this project today, but um, people have stumbled upon it as we've been developing it. Um, cause we do everything in the open. So even though we've never really announced it, um, it's been out there in GitHub and we've had quite a bit of interest in it without marketing it or anything. So uh, it's all based on user demand. So, but we do kind of expect I, th I think there'll be a good amount of demand for this, we hope. Um, so, you know, if, if it goes well, I really hope we can do a GA that this year. Um, but, you know, can't commit. <laughs> yeah. The, um, Henry asked, uh, you know, and if you need, if you need GA for this sooner, just reach out to us. I mean, we'll always. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. If you need something, you see like an immediate use case, we have like, there's like 30 people that are doing interesting tests on this stuff right now, all of which are asking for a GA sooner. So, you know, the more people need it, the more we can put resources on getting it brought forward. Um, Henry asked us, how do you operate under intermittent in connection for certain nodes? Right. Yeah. So that one, um, I'd say like we, we haven't, we're, we're still working on it. That's kind of, I would say on the list of like to do for GA. Um, so right now you just basically, we have to tweak some of the intervals. So it, it will, I mean, it, it, uh, it does work. The problem you have to just be afraid of is, is if a node goes unavailable for a certain amount of time, Kubernetes is going to start moving around workloads. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what's the right balance there of, you know, how quickly do you want to react and how to configure that and tune it. So I would say that's one of the areas where we're still, you know, kind of working on it. So it's like, it does work, but I think there's, there's little, little issues, issues in, in how quickly Kubernetes will respond and it might do the wrong thing or what you don't want it to do. Awesome. There was a, another question from Hussein who kind of followed up on his earlier question and he was saying, well, if, if he starts with SQLite in a single node and etcd then is using a cluster node, could you start with, how do you start with a single node and then scale that out to say three or five nodes in the future? So if I, if you start with yeah, SQLite, yeah. Is there any way to switch to etcd as you need to scale, you want to just kind of, kind of discuss that? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the SQLite is, it's a very simple, um, Kind of data structure that's in there because it's just key value so so I, as i was saying we're still technically working on the ha solution so it's not really f f like working right now so we are as we implement that we will we will um provide a means to basically move from the sqlite to that cd which is just basically a script to basically export the database and put it into sqlite or into etcd because it's a very very simple structure um, so it's it's not very hard to move between the two. Um, the the kind of the side effect of I, what I was saying before is that the the behavior of etcd is so baked into Kubernetes that to implement it on top of a, a relational database, you actually have to replicate the log structure of of etcd. So it actually mimics the structure of etcd pretty closely. So it's pretty easy to move between the two with just a migration script. But that doesn't exist today. As we'll, we'll um, so again, as we march towards GA, we'll have like the full HA HA setup. Awesome. Uh, next question was from Erno. He said, and by the way, there, there's more questions coming in as I asked. So that's why I know we said they had 11 before. We somehow still have 11. So we're just not. <laughs> feel free to keep firing them in. Just FYI. That's why we keep going. Erno said, is Container D image download process more edge efficient than the Docker parallel mode? Oh, actually, no. Unfortunately, so there's a there's a there's an issue in a PR right now um, that, in fact, the pulling of images and staging them of them is currently slower than Docker, unfortunately, and the uh, um, the the they so they have a PR in right now um, that actually makes it faster. But even if it's faster, it's still fundamentally the same thing. So it doesn't do anything cool like. Let's say, um, oh, there's one from, uh, oh, I can't remember. There's one from like Alibaba that does kind of like a bit torn approach. Uh, so there's there's nothing f fancier there. So it's still fundamentally just downloading them all from the central source. So it's not doing like peer to peer sharing. But I'm very interested in in figuring out how to get that stuff in there. 
Um, what is more realistic in the short term is that we're going to figure out, like provide ways to uh, easily download and package the content ahead of time so that you can just like, you know, like here's the, like a kind of the tarball of the, of the images. So you can just put that on the device. Um, so you don't have to download it. Cause most of, so most of these, these setups or whatever is they really, um, they would prefer as much as possible to kind of already be pre-staged on the device, not like dynamically pulling it down. It's a little bit more static. Awesome. Uh, Fazad asked, what is the reason Calico was not used and instead you used uh, flannel? Uh, just smaller, lighter weight. I mean, Calico, well, so in general, there's different parts of Calico. So Calico is kind of, um, it's a good networking solution, but it doesn't just kind of generically work anywhere. Um, there's certain uh, situations where, you know, because of like having to use like IP and IP or, 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 you know, BGP or whatnot, like it requires some integration with the, uh, with the network setup or whatever. So I, so, and maybe I could be wrong uh, in this area, but I don't think it just basically kind of generically will work always everywhere, but it is a great, a great solution. So flannel, the flannel VX line one is kind of the lowest common denominator, denominator. It works everywhere. But one of the things is we don't have right now a network policy implementation out of the box. And so that's something that we would look at pulling from Calico, which is, I think it's technically Felix, um, which is the, the policy manager. Uh, so that we would be looking at, but, but so it's just the, the main reason we didn't pull in Calico is just the, uh, the, I just, I don't think it, it's, I don't think it just works everywhere, just kind of out of the box. But again, you can disable flannel and you can bring in whatever CNI you want. So when you launch, launch the agent, there's, um, pretty sure it is just K3S. Eight. Oh wait. Yeah, it's right there. You say no flannel that will disable the, the embedded flannel. Uh, and then after that, you just need, uh, I'll show you right here. Flannel. If you disable flannel, then you can just go here to the Kubernetes setup and you can install any one of these. Just run these add ons just through kubectl. Um, and the most of these will just work. That kind of led into Kevin's question, which is the next question, Darren. He said, Do network policy resources work with K3S networking out of the box? No, so not out of the box. So you are going to have to deploy a policy, uh, some component that enforces the policy. Um, so I think that's something reasonable that we would, we could include into K3S or make it as like an option to, to turn on. Um, a lot of people don't use network policy, so it's, it's a little harder for like the edge use case. I am um, not seeing like, I guess a huge, kind of a huge demand for that, but I think, uh, it would make sense having an optional component we could turn on. So it automatically deploy, um, like, uh, Felix or whatever. Uh, David, uh, David asked, what does the process look like to upgrade K3S server slash agent to the latest version? Yeah. So right now, um, I mean, it's, it's really, it's just this binary. So if you were, if you replace the binary and restart, so on the server, just replace the binary restart on the agents, replace it and restart. So that's all it is right now. So the idea is that that's pretty simple. It's just a binary and then we can, kind of wrap that however we want, like, you know, put it into a, a proper OS packages or build a auto upgrade process, you know, some type of installer or something. So right now it's a pretty basic unit of just, it's a binary. So just replace it and restart and you should be good to go. Um, the, uh, the normal, like if I kill, if I have all the containers running and I kill the agent, it won't kill the containers. They'll still, they'll keep running. So you just put the new one in and then, then it runs a new one. Okay, I think we're almost, we're, we're certainly past the time, but we've got four or five more questions left. We'll try to get through these and, uh, and then wrap up pretty quickly. Steven said, are there any OS dependencies on the nodes? Could I use something like Tiny Core Linux? Would it still work with Docker via the flag even on Tiny Core? So there's really no OS dependencies. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you just a little bit kind of under the hood how this works is when we, uh, K3S is actually an archive that extracts um, and runs out of that 
And so it goes into this data directory and it's hashed according to the version. And so basically this is everything we have. It's pretty much a full busy box setup um, with like key things like uh, SOCAT and run C uh, pigs. So basically we have pretty much like a full micro distribution of Linux. Uh, so there's no OS dependencies at all. So the, the key things though, is that like, is like the sys, like sys, C, like these C groups need to be set up properly. The, the, so the proc, sys, and dev mounts need to be set up properly. So most Linux distributions do this already. Something like tiny core probably won't. Um, but if you, you know, know how to mount these, then, then you can do that. But so that's basically the only dependency. So the binary itself is even like um, statically compiled against muscle. So we don't, we don't have any uh, OS dependencies at all. Uh, it's just the Linux kernel, the uh, same kernel, and the proper mounts. Awesome. Uh, Jethro kind of asked a follow on, it's sort of the same question, slight variation. What do I need to start with K3S when I have an OS, say Ubuntu, is the only thing I need to do, download this and run it like you demoed, or do I need some other settings to do first? On Raspberry Pi, you showed something about boot settings. I can't find anything in the README on GitHub about this. Yeah, so um, there's really nothing you need to do for most modern Linux distributions. So like if you're using a mainstream normal one, you know, Ubuntu, Red Hat, um, you know, SUSE, whatever, the, all the normal kind of big ones or whatever, uh, Debian, um, it will just work. You, so you should just be able to download it and run it, just run that curl script or manually put the binary in place. Um, so Raspberry Pi is a little unique because they've flipped off some of the default settings for memory reasons. Uh, we'll probably, we'll update the docs uh, to put some of those steps for the Raspberry Pi. It's really just that one setting, um, but the, the binary will warn you anyways. So the installation is as much as possible. We want to make it so it's really just put that binary and run it. Um, so, so, you know, it includes everything that, that it needs. Awesome. Um, two last questions. This was a follow-up to the upgrade question. Uh, Yaramir asked, he said, what's the disruption to workloads while upgrading, especially in non-HA mode? So if I upgrade the K3S server, what happens to the workloads and the containers running? Yeah, so I mean, so this is like kind of normal uh, Kubernetes architecture stuff is like the Kubernetes architecture is well done in that the, the control plane and the data plane are separated such that like, if you take down any of like, let's say the, the, the server or you take down the agent, those are considered, considered like control plane components. All of your workload, the networking, the load balancer, all that stuff will continue to work. So your applications are still up and running even if you kill the, the server or the agents. If those are down, you obviously can't interact with Kubernetes and do anything, but you know that's kind of expected if I bring down the server and replace it, upgrade it. Uh, it, will, it will work just fine. So you should be able to uh, upgrade this thing with no impact to your applications. That's the general idea. Um, sometimes depending on how big of an upgrade it is between the internal Kubernetes versions, the pods might get uh, reloaded. So that kind of depends on the Kubernetes if they make a change that they have to reload pods. But if it's just like a normal patch, uh, release, then there shouldn't be any impact. Awesome. Uh, last question, Jacob asked if there were any thoughts or plans towards automatic peer slash participant discovery and join. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we're, you know, that's when we're getting towards like the HA stuff. Um, there has been some ideas of, of basically including gossip um, to like auto form clusters. Um, so we're, we're seeing about that. There's also a, a, a decent library or utility available from HashiCorp. Um, I think it's just called like discovery that helps you bootstrap and discover clusters from cloud providers. Um, so we've been looking at kind of integrating, kind of integrating those things when we get into HA because HA gets a little bit more complicated because you have to know the peers, you know, who are the peers, what's their advertised address, and, and, and those things dynamically change. Awesome. Uh, so I think, you know, we covered all of this stuff we wanted to cover. I think I'm switched to my screen.
screen now, Darren, that we're sharing. Sure. But just to, uh, for anyone who wants to kind of find this stuff out there, um, you know, we've got a website set up for k3s.io. You can also find it on GitHub, just github.com slash rancher slash k3s. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, Darren and I are more than happy to take your questions whenever you have them. Just shoot us a note on Slack or Zoom or wherever it's convenient for you. Um, with that, I think we're, we're wrapped up. Caitlin, thank you so much for inviting us to present and to, for hosting us today. Yeah, thank you both for the great presentation.